wanted to pick up on the notion of wonder, because I think that's really key here. And uh, in terms of the types of knowing that I was talking about, you know, what I want us to do is um, practice wonder more than our culture um, helps us to do. And so for me, whatever, um, you know, if it's staring at a poorly clover or if it's uh, contemplating your own breathing or if it's, for me, often it's the moon that kind of evokes that kind of feeling, um, um, I think it's really important that we get back in touch with that sense of wonder, which is um, something that every child has absolutely. Um, and what, one of the things I talk about in the Time for Hope book is habits that we have to cultivate in our day and age in order to have hope. And one of the habits is wild wonder. And I think we need to practice uh, that habit. No, I, 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 think, I think it's an important habit to emphasize, but I need to ask you, in the name of experiencing awe or wonder, which is you know something majestic and part of the whole human experiment, does it have to be, or should it be, aligned to, I mean, you're a theologian, does it have to be aligned to something that we're thinking of as a, having a spiritual dimension to it? In other words, I know people who come to me and they say, I have communion with nature, I feel connected to nature, I feel a higher power, but I don't necessarily have, again, what I think we're calling cornerstone or another learning of belief, faith. I haven't talked about belief. I've talked about attitude, um, relationship, trust. Uh, I've talked about ways in which we are in relationship with reality, mundane reality, ultimate reality, and reality. Um, Belief is the story, the narrative that you put on that. And there are lots of narratives, uh, and there are a lot of different belief systems for people. And you know, that is a way to give it form and community and structure and, like I said, story. But more fun, what's really fundamentally going on in all those uh, various stories, structures, etc., is this. Uh, relating to life in a really fundamental way, in an open way, a trusting way, and in a wondrous way. So I wanted to, before we open the floor up to questions, I wanted to comment that the, the notion of breathing and um, air, and the, the essence is the, is the root of the definition of spirituality. I looked it up in the octave. <laughs> um, so is there a biochemical processes or something that goes on in the mind when you take a breath and try to clear your mind that reflects something that you might be able to define as a spiritual process physically? You're asking me. I'm asking you. <laughs> well, there are people who experience that as a, as a spiritual process, and then there are many people who don't, and there are many times when one don't. And, you know, I've been breathing all day today, but it hasn't been particularly spiritual. And so I'm sorry to have that. <laughs> but in response to your question, yes. So that if you put somebody in the brain imaging scanner and they're not having a spiritual experience, and at another time they are, uh, is there a distinct difference in their brain activity in certain emotional areas? That should be very much yes. There's been a lot of experiment along these lines. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Dalai Lama has worked with people like Danny Goldman, you know, uh, in terms of things like Buddhist practice and meditation and breathing and how it can elevate the senses and elevate the mind and consciousness and really create something I suppose that you could call spatially a spiritual, I think Dr. Lewis said it best, a, maybe a virtual reality, but it's a higher sense of thinking and a higher sense of emotion. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'd like to follow up on that idea, but also what, what Flora said about awe. Um, because we do, in our modern society, we love physics and engineering and science so much that we do tend to lose track of that other part. And we don't go, wow, nearly as much. I try to do it every day. But I, I just want to share with you a little ceremony that I hope many of you would follow. In, in Bali is Parsifal. Parsifal is walking home through the wilderness. And he asks Gurnamans, why is everything so beautiful today? 
And Gernemans res responds, oh, that's Good Friday's magic, my lord. I love that. And what I started doing with my children when they were little, and by the way, Good Friday magic or Good Friday spell was some, was some of Wagner's most beautiful music. But what I do, what I do every Good Friday now, uh, I start when my children were little, and I'd say, oh, uh, that's a, you ever notice how pretty this thing is? I mean, really, it, just look at it. Isn't it really, really amazing when you look at it? And she would agree. And I'd say, that's Good Friday's magic. It's because today is Good Friday. What about those of us who say that's classic? It's not our environment. <laughs> exactly. That makes my point. It's less pretty. Now, the most wonderful thing happened about 40 years later when she said to me, Daddy, isn't it true that this is really beautiful on Good Friday because that's the day when we look at it and notice it? And, and so I've set up a ritual. Once a year, we make a point of. I get emails from my daughter in New York saying, isn't everything pretty today, Daddy? <laughs> so I, I, I'm making it into a ritual so that we don't forget that wow awe, which is so easy to forget when we live in a world in which, because of physics, we win wars. All right, on that note, I would like to open the, uh, open the floor for questions.